on South African coal exports. I'm really worried about the fate of many, many thousands uh, uh, of uh, not only the coal miners who don't get any unemployment benefit as they do in our countries, but also of all their family members. I do not believe that sanctions will help to bring apartheid to an end. They may, however, cause poverty, unemployment and starvation among many black South Africans. Tonight, the British side were guests of honour at a formal dinner given by Dr Cole. And both leaders now seem to feel they've got grounds for hope that the pressures on them over sanctions are finally fading. This is John Simpson for the 9 o'clock news in Bonn. In South Africa tonight, there are growing fears for hundreds of miners who've been trapped underground for more than 12 hours after a fire at one of the country's biggest gold mines. At least 13 men are known to have been killed and more than 60 have been injured. The fire broke out this morning, but news of it wasn't revealed until early this evening. And for several hours since then, there's been no further word from the authorities on the fate of those trapped underground. There were more than 2,000 men working at the Kinross gold mine in the eastern Transvaal at the time. Around 1,800 were brought to the surface, leaving some 400 behind. Michael Burke reports. The accident happened at half past nine this morning, but the news was suppressed until this evening, and even now the mine owners will not give details of the full extent of the disaster. We do know there was an explosion sparked off by welding equipment in a connecting gallery between two mine shafts several thousand feet underground. The explosion set fire to cables and other equipment, creating a cloud of poison gas which rolled into the number two shaft where over 2,000 men were working. The Afrikaans mining firm Gencor says 13 of its miners were killed by the gas and more than 60 injured. Nearly 5,000 men were evacuated, but it appears that there are still 400 trapped underground 12 hours now since the explosion happened. More than that, the company refuses to say, but there are indications the disaster may be much more serious. A matron at a local white hospital says 52 white miners have been admitted suffering from the effects of poison gas. But for every white miner underground, there are 20 blacks. The black casualties are being taken to a mine hospital nearby, which is refusing to give any information. A short while ago, a civil defense organizer in the area said he was being told nothing of what was happening, except, he said, to prepare for a massive number of corpses. The SDP conference has called unanimously for tougher measures against South Africa. Before the debate, many delegates had received letters from the South African ambassador arguing that the Pretoria government was making progress against apartheid. But the SDP president, Shirley Williams, said she took strong exception to his interference and the party had no doubts on the subject. Steve McCormack reporting. The letter was posted first class to hotel rooms of conference delegates. Its author, the South African ambassador, urged the party not to back sanctions. They would, he said, be an act of immorality. Two embassy officials have been at the conference as observers all week. They heard the party's president take strong exception to their ambassador's intervention. The violation of human rights in South Africa, the unwillingness to release Nelson Mandela, and the failure so far to attempt any negotiation on political rights with those who speak for the black majority are matters to which the South African ambassador should address himself, not this conference. And in an emergency debate on South Africa, the party was united in demanding action. We have to show our utter, complete contempt for apartheid. It isn't a question of whether economic sanctions will work. It's a question of taking a moral stance. Sanctions will call the bluff of the Afrikaners. They will raise the morale of the oppressed while lowering that of the oppressors. A motion urging the government to take unanimous. further measures against Pretoria was passed unanimously. But the two observers, unsettled by today's frosty reception, were saying little. If you want to comment on that debate, you should call the embassy. They've listened into the debate. And if you want any comment, I feel you should call the embassy. An Old Bailey jury has been told that an IRA plot to blow up a Blackpool pub used by soldiers and their families was foiled because one of the men involved could no longer bear what was going on. 
The bombers were said to have been kept under observation for several months before the police lost them in a car chase. On trial is Thomas Maguire, said to be an IRA intelligence officer. He denies conspiring with others to cause an explosion. Our home affairs correspondent Bill Hamilton reports. Thomas Maguire, a 27-year-old Irish graduate, was described in court as an IRA intelligence officer. The prosecution claimed that letters were sent by Maguire from Dublin to his mother's house in Blackpool, addressed to a man she was living with at the time. One ended with the words, please burn this, don't forget. The man who received them, Raymond O'Connor, was being asked to help in an IRA bomb plot, but turned supergrass when it's alleged he could no longer stand what was going on. The information he gave to Lancashire Police, it was said, enabled them to foil a plan to blow up this country pub near Wheaton Army Camp, a few miles from Blackpool. It was often frequented by soldiers and their families. When the plot was hatched in 1982, the barracks housed the 2nd Battalion Light Infantry, who had close connections with Northern Ireland. Later, O'Connor met two IRA men he knew as the mechanic and the minder, Patrick McGee and Patrick Murray. These are photographs the Crown said the police took of the three of them during a long-term surveillance operation. This picture, shown to the jury, shows O'Connor and McGee getting off a bus outside the Eagle and Child pub. The prosecution claim O'Connor visited Dublin by boat to meet IRA contacts. In Blackpool, he helped hire a flat for McGee and Murray, and police photographed them going in and out. Then, in April 1983, when the prosecution claimed the bomb plot was in its final stages, McGee and Murray managed to evade the police. They had been followed along the motorway from Blackpool to Preston, and realising they were being tailed, got away after a high-speed car chase. When the car was later found abandoned at Preston Railway Station, the lights were still on, the windscreen wipers still operating, and the doors were flung wide open. The case continues tomorrow. Bill Hamilton. More than a million council manual workers have been offered pay rises of 6.7% and the unions are recommending that they accept it. It's a bitter blow for the government who wants settlements kept much lower in line with inflation. The Environment Secretary Nicholas Ridley said he saw no justification for the offer. He said the government wouldn't provide more money. Local authority representatives arrived, having been told by government ministers that a generous offer wasn't justified and it would do nothing to help generate new jobs. Last year, the council workers settled for 8%, and the government blames them for inflating expectations amongst other groups in both the public and private sectors. Average earnings are now running at 7.5%. That's way above the current rate of inflation, which stood at 2.4% last month. But many of the council workers are low paid, and say the retail price index doesn't adequately reflect the rises in things that matter most to them. Food, council house rents, and rail and bus fares. The two sides emerged after a long negotiating session, minus the Tory councillors, who'd walked out on the majority Labour group, saying the offer was ill-considered. But the employer's chief negotiator said it wasn't fair of ministers to use the council workers as an economic weapon. It's far too onerous a burden to place upon local government manual workers to ne no negotiate not only for ourselves, but for the rest of the economy. We cannot do it. It's too great a burden to bear. And the union side also resented the ministerial intervention. It's beyond the right of any government, of any political colour, to interfere and to come into negotiations and try to, in a sense, mess around with the negotiations for local government, manual workers, for low-paid workers, unless they have an alternative to, an alternative to offer. These negotiations have gone sadly wrong for the government. Ministers intervened quite blatantly to stop this deal going through. Now they've got the worst of all possible worlds. Their advice has been totally ignored, and now every negotiator in the country knows about it. And the SDP conference has given its backing to a plan to fight unemployment by borrowing more money and expanding the economy. But the party's had to modify its forecasts in the light of what it sees as the increasingly bleak economic outlook. The hope is now to create two million new jobs inside five years. 
Social Democrats have carved out a policy on jobs that's distinct from Conservatives and Labour. They fear Mrs Thatcher plans to fight the general election with four million out of work, but an irresponsible pre-election boom. We seem to be on course on course for an economy with a huge financial sector but a stunted real economy a kind of financial enclave attached to a shanty town economy the sdp doesn't rule out a more active state role in creating jobs in modern times if you want to maintain and expand your industrial base governments cannot leave industrial matters to the free play of the market but the Social Democrats say Labour would try expansion without having an income strategy and debate. prices would run riot. Their economic spokesman, Ian Rigglesworth, plans to control wages by imposing tax penalties on companies that pay over the odds. Tonight he played in the annual cricket match. He later revealed what a sticky economic wicket he expects after the election. The party scaled down its target for cutting unemployment. The aim now is a million fewer on the dole by 1988. The policies that we've outlined at this conference, that we would be able to get unemployment down uh, by 1988 uh, by almost a million, that is not as good a figure as I would like it to be. I, obviously, I would love to get it down much more quickly and much more substantially than that. But with this balance of payments problem, it's impossible. Share prices in London have dropped sharply for the second time in a week. The fall followed news overnight of the biggest ever one-day fall in the Japanese stock market and rumours that a big American bank was about to collapse. The index of 100 top companies closed down 31.6 points at 1596.7. The inquest into the Manchester air disaster has been told that the makers of the plane's engine had warned of a potential fault in its combustion system. The jury was shown parts of the combustion chamber, which were so cracked that parts of it blew off, pip puncturing the fuel tank and causing the fire. With actual parts of the Pratt & Whitney engine recovered from the wreckage, the jury was shown exactly what went wrong. A combustion can in the engine cracked so badly the top of it was blown off and flew away from the engine, ripping a hole in part of the fuel tank over the wing. Stephen Moss, one of the investigating team, said cracking was common in combustion cans. One of the remedies was to apply heat treatment to them. Although this hadn't been done with this engine, he didn't think it would have made any difference. The inquest was told that in all, 17 complaints have been received about the acceleration and idling speed of the engine. Other airlines had also experienced problems with the combustion system. In a few cases, pieces had been thrown out of the engine, exactly what happened at Manchester. Mr Moss was asked by the coroner if he felt that at the time engineers passed the aircraft as fit to fly, British Airways could have known about the possibility of severe problems with the engine's combustion system. He replied yes, in as much as there had been a series of letters from the manufacturers informing and advising airlines about the engine. Mr Moss will be further questioned about his evidence when the inquest resumes tomorrow morning. The Education Secretary, Kenneth Baker, has demanded the banning of a school book about a little girl who lives with her father and his homosexual lover. Mr Baker says the book is blatant homosexual propaganda and he's asked the Inner London Education Authority to withdraw it, but the authority has refused to do so. It says that only some children are allowed to read the book and then only after their parents have been consulted. Controversy has surrounded the book for almost a year. Its intention is to show that relationships between those of the same sex are as valid as those between members of the opposite sex. And the effect on children is discussed too. Mr Baker condemns those education authorities that have made such a book available to children. I don't think that it actually helps in the understanding of homosexuality to portray a, a young girl of seven in bed with two semi-naked men, for example. Homosexuality is going to be treated in a mature way when it comes up in sex education classes at school. It does come up. There's some very good material on sex education. But this is propaganda. The actual book in question is for use with a child uh, who finds that his or her parents have split up and formed a different kind of home. 
It really has nothing to do, actually, uh, with encouraging or discouraging homosexuality. What it has to do with is the needs of a child in very specific circumstances. At North Westminster School near Paddington, we learned that despite assurances to the contrary, the controversial book had been available without restriction for several months. There are amongst the people of our country gay relationships with children. A study by London University has shown that the children of such relationships, they're not very numerous, but the children of such relationships are as successful psychologically, socially, and education as the cross-section of ordinary people. They are there and they cannot be blotted out of life by a decision of the Secretary of State. And Mr. Marlin's school library contains several other books that discuss homosexuality. He intends they should stay there. So does the Inner London Education Authority, whatever Mr. Baker may say. A Scottish loch which is so acid that all the fish in it have died is being brought back to life. The Electricity Board is spending one and a half million pounds restoring Loch Fleet in Galloway in southwest Scotland to its original condition. They say the project shows how other lakes affected by acid rain could become full of fish again. Loch Fleet in southwest Scotland is one of Britain's few acid lakes. Thirty years ago, brown trout flourished here. Now the peaty waters have no fish in them. No one knows exactly why the loch became acid. The pine forest planted alongside didn't help. And acid rain was also a cause. And it rains here a lot, more than six feet of rain a year. The loch is now a test bed. To overcome the acidity, scientists are treating the land around the loch with hundreds of tons of lime. The rain then dissolves it slowly and deposits it in the loch. Various ways are being tried, tipping limestone by hand, or spreading it as a slurry. Without this treatment, lakes could remain acid for decades, even if sulphur is taken out of smoke from power stations. So how expensive is it? In Scandinavia, in Sweden, for example, they are liming pretty well all the lakes of concern for a cost of about 10 million pounds a year. So that gives you some idea of the cost. And as you know, to fit flue gas desulphurization to our major plant would cost perhaps two and a half billion pounds. So we think it's a sensible and economic complement to reducing emissions. Eventually, tiny brown trout will be reintroduced into Loch Fleet, hopefully to establish themselves permanently. The treatment of the land around here only started in the spring, but already the loch is much less acid and good enough to support fish. There are up to a hundred other lakes and streams in Britain which, like this one, are now fishless. The lessons learned here will help restore them and thousands like them in Scandinavia back to normality. The French government has offered a reward of a million francs, that's about £100,000, for information about the terrorists who've carried out four bomb attacks in Paris. The police have issued pictures of two suspects. They're the younger brothers of Georges Abdallah, a Lebanese guerrilla leader. He's in prison in Lyon, and his release is one of the main demands of the bombers. With three dead and over 100 people injured in a week of attacks, security has been tightened throughout France. The Prime Minister, Jacques Chirac, has cancelled plans to visit Canada, saying he had to stay in France to lead the fight against the terrorists. A new generation of the Kennedy family is entering American politics more than 20 years after John F. Kennedy was president. Today, his nephew Joseph is fighting for the same congressional seat in Massachusetts that his uncle won 40 years ago. For millions, John Kennedy's administration was the launch of a new era, but the dream was short-lived, ending in assassination in Dallas in 1963. The family's hopes passed to Robert, the president's brother, who was attorney general. But in 1968, he too was assassinated. One brother remained, Edward Kennedy. Again, he was tipped for the presidency, but his hopes faded after the scandal surrounding a car crash at Chappaquiddick. Now, a new generation of Kennedys has entered the political arena. Robert's daughter, Kathleen, is campaigning for Congress in Maryland. But it's her brother, Joseph, in Massachusetts, who has the greater chance of being elected. The 8th District of Boston, part academic, part working class, is as solid a democratic territory as you can find. It even went for Walter Mondale by 76% in 1984. It's been in the Kennedy family before. John Kennedy held it before moving on to the Senate and then the presidency. Joe Kennedy wants it back. I view the campaign for this seat not merely as a contest, but as an opportunity. 
to deepen my understanding of your problems and to let you learn more about me, what I am, what I believe in, and what I stand for. How are you, Joe Kennedy? Nice to see you. I hope I can get your vote, please, huh? Ah, you're terrific. What they found was a 33-year-old candidate of great charm and energy with surprisingly conservative positions on some issues. He favored the bombing of Libya and the death penalty for personal reasons. No, I uh, lost my father to a, a, a cold-blooded murderer who uh, I, I now have to sit and watch along with my brothers and sisters and my mother as each year he comes up for uh, parole in the state of California. Joe Kennedy isn't the only famous name in the field of 11. James Roosevelt's grandfather was president. But the other guy who really made a race of it was George Backrack, a state senator, who but for Kennedy would have been the easy favorite. In the closing days, Joe Kennedy enlisted his family. Hi, ma'am. How are you? I'm Teddy Kennedy. And an endorsement from the retiring congressman. We need fighters in the Congress. That's why I'm voting for Joe Kennedy for a career that could aim high. This is Martin Bell for the 9 o'clock news in Washington. And now back to the main news again. More than 250 miners in South Africa are now believed to have been killed in a fire in a gold mine. From Johannesburg, Michael Burke has the latest details. A few minutes ago, the mine owners said 240 miners were still missing tonight, in addition to the 13 whose bodies have already been recovered. Managers at the mine are reported to have said a short while ago that the chances of saving any of those still missing are very poor and getting worse by the hour. There are eight rescue teams working some 5,000 feet underground, and the recovery operation has not yet been called off. Meantime, a total of 183 miners are now said officially to have been admitted to hospital. This is Michael Burke in Johannesburg, returning you to the studio. And that's the national and international news tonight. Good night. Good night. <laughs> And now the headlines in the southeast. Good evening. The Common Select Committee on Transport has begun hearing complaints from angry residents in Kent opposed to the Channel Tunnel. During the six days of hearings in Hythe and Dover, committee members are expected to plough through nearly 7,000 complaints. Police in Sussex have tonight renewed their appeal for help from the public in identifying the dismembered torso of a woman. Parts of the headless body, which was found last month in Ashdown Forest, were wrapped in curtains. Detectives want anyone who recognises them to come forward. In Berkshire, two men who fled with £120,000 after an armed raid are still at large tonight. They ambushed a security guard who was delivering cash to a bank inside the county council building in Shinfield. A toy oven imported from Mexico is believed to be on sale in the southeast. Hertfordshire trading standards officers say children could be electrocuted while playing with the oven, which is sold under the name Super Horno Magico Lily. Thousands of motorists face long traffic jams in Kent tonight after an accident on the M2 in Rochester. A tanker leaked 28,000 litres of petrol and the motorway had to be sealed off between junctions 1 and 3. The master of the ship, which collided with Southend Pier in June, is to appear before magistrates tomorrow to face a number of charges. The ship, the King's Ferry, was piloted by Captain Frank Boyd. Damage to the pier has been estimated at more than £1 million. And finally, wives in the tiny Hertfordshire village of Little Wymondley have imposed the ultimate sanction on their husbands. They've banned sex for the rest of the week. They want to make sure their menfolk are fighting fit for a march on Friday in their campaign for a village bypass. And that's tonight's news in the South East. I'll be back tomorrow morning at breakfast time. I do hope you'll be able to join me then. Hello, come and look at the satellite picture. It shows mainly good news. Now there is an active front over France and Germany, but that's being pushed slowly southwards into the continent. Uh, there's another front out here in the Atlantic that's coming along too, but it's fairly weak. It's in between this large area of very well broken cloud. That's 
a high pressure area and it's going to continue to give most of us fine weather over the next few days. That's the chart that should correspond to that picture and you can see that large nose of high pressure over the country giving most northern districts particularly a good deal of fine weather. They've had it for ages and, they'll get, and there's more to come. That front gradually moving off down into the continent and taking the rain that's now affecting the channel with it. Let's have a look at today's figures. Again, it's the north that's uh, been best. Morecambe again featuring in the, the records there. All right, Guernsey, it wasn't much of a day down there, but it will be drier tomorrow. Let's have a look at the weather in just a bit more detail. Still raining in the Channel Islands. In fact, some quite heavy rain in places. That rain is just about moving northeastwards and just about skirting the coast of the southeast of the mainland there. Most places though dry, just a few very light showers in the north and west, some fog and frost patches by the end of the night. Minus one is just 30 degrees Fahrenheit. Tomorrow, a lot of dry, bright weather with a good deal of sunshine. Some light showers, we think of a northern Ireland, north and west Scotland, one or two light showers too, near some of those eastern coasts of England. The rest of us dry, a good deal of uh, sunshine as well. Starting off though cloudy in the channel, that cloud and light rain in places moving away during the course of the morning, all dry by the afternoon. Still on the cool side, 14 Celsius is just 57 Fahrenheit, but wind not as strong as today. Thursday, very little change, a lot of sunshine, rather more cloud in northern Britain with perhaps a little drizzle. Finally, a summary off tomorrow's weather. Most of us dry and bright, can't be bad. Good night. <laughs> There's another real-life case tomorrow night for the Animal Squad and for Chief Inspector Sid Jenkins of the RSPCA. We'd like to give him a chance. If we can. What do you think? I mean, well, uh, is this going to survive? It's, mm. We take it's a all... chance, but I wouldn't guarantee it. Trouble is, it's so At any one down. time, there are around half a million stray dogs on the streets of Britain, some of whose owners have simply abandoned them or who cannot be traced. But some animals are brought in that have been badly treated. Animals that are sick and sometimes dying. Tomorrow's programme follows Sid Jenkins and his team on one particular case as they are called to a house where the condition of a dog is causing concern to the neighbours. Animal Squad is tomorrow night at 9.30 on BBC One. On one now, Robbie Box, who's always on the lookout for that big deal.